questions will come to order. Uh, before we get to the Older Americans Act, which is an issue of enormous consequence, I just wanted to say a few words on briefly on, on some other subjects. Uh, first, uh, as all of you know, uh, this committee has spent a lot of time on the high cost of prescription drugs in America and the fact that in some cases we pay 10 times more for the same products uh, that people in other countries pay. Uh, this committee did an investigation, an exhaustive investigation, on inhalers. Uh, millions of people have asthma and OPCD, and it is very difficult for them to pay for the products that they need. Uh, I am, during the last couple of weeks, among other things, I have talked to the major manufacturers of those inhalers. There are four major ones. Two of them were receptive, two of them not so much. Uh, but I'm very happy to mention today that one of those manufacturers, uh, Behringer Ingelheim, announced that it is substantially lowering the cost of their inhalers in America by making sure that every uninsured or underinsured patient in the country will pay no more than $35 for those devices. And uh, that is a big deal. And I very much appreciate the step forward by Behringer Ingelheim. And we look forward to the other manufacturers following suit. Uh, on another issue, uh, I wanted uh, to tell you what all of you know, and that is the minibus that was passed by the House yesterday and will soon, I expect, be passed by the Senate contains new funding for community health centers, the National Health Service Corps, and teaching health centers. These issues this committee has worked hard on. Uh, the Community Health Center program will go up from $4 billion to ma in mandatory funding to $4.4 billion. The National Health Service Corps will go up from $310 million in funding to $364. And the Teaching Health Center program will go up from $126 million to $175 million. Now, given the dysfunctionality of the United States Congress, these are not insignificant steps forward. But given the crisis that we face in primary health care, we are not accomplishing anything near what we have got to do. System is completely broken. We waste enormous amounts of money when people end up in the emergency room and hospital because they don't get the primary care they need. So my point is I look forward very much uh, to continuing uh, the work that we have begun on primary health care and seeing if we can do a bit more uh, in the remaining months uh, ahead of us. Uh, let's get to the subject matter uh, of the day, and that is the Older Americans Act. According to the OECD, 23% of seniors in America are living in poverty, compared to just 12% in Canada, 9% in Germany, and 4.4% in France. Further, one out of every four seniors in America is trying to survive on an income of less than $15,000 a year, and I'm not quite sure how anybody can survive on $15,000 a year. Uh, today, we will be paying attention to the urgent, unmet needs of millions of seniors in America and what we should do as a society to reduce the senior poverty rate, to reduce hunger, and to improve the health and well-being of our parents and grandparents, the people who helped build this country. In America today, 12 million seniors are dealing with food insecurity. Quite unbelievable, but true. Nearly a quarter of our nation's seniors are considered to be socially isolated, a huge issue. And more than one out of every four seniors suffer from falls, tragic falls, uh, the leading cause of death from injury among our elderly population, something we don't pay enough attention to. Nearly 95% of adults over the age of 60 have a chronic health condition, and 80% have two or more chronic conditions uh, like high blood pressure, arthritis, and diabetes. Seniors throughout our country, particularly in rural areas, lack the transportation they need to get to a doctor's office, the grocery store, or the dentist. And that should not be happening in the richest country in the history of the world. In my view, both from a moral uh, and from an economic perspective, we cannot turn our backs on the millions and millions of seniors who are hurting and who desperately need our help today. So here is the good news. The good news is we have a very effective piece of legislation on the books to address the urgent needs of vulnerable seniors, and that is the Older Americans Act. And I want to thank all of our panelists and so many people around the country who have worked so hard on that piece of legislation. The, old, <clears throat> the Older Americans Act provides federal funding for many essential services 
for our nation's seniors, including helping older adults live at home rather than end up in nursing homes, <coughs> supporting our nation's caregivers, uh, activities to combat loneliness and isolation, preventing disease, job training, protections from abuse, and rise to the doctor's office and grocery store. Importantly, and this is maybe the main point of the day, about 45% of funding for the Older Americans Act is used to provide meals to millions of frail and isolated seniors through Meals on Wheels program and through congregate meal programs at senior centers. So when we talk about the Older Americans Act, let's not forget 45% of the funding goes to nutrition programs for seniors who need them. And I suspect all of us have been to senior centers and seen the effectiveness of the congregate meal program and, and the Meals on Wheels program. Uh, and let us be clear, and this is a point that needs to be made over and over again. These nutrition programs not only provide good nutrition, but anyone who understands the Meals on Wheels program knows that it's important is not just the actual meals delivered, it's somebody knocking on the door, saying hello, asking how you're doing, breaking through the isolation. That's what Meals on Wheels program does, and we thank all the volunteers who are involved in those efforts. Uh, but not only does the Older Americans Act save lives and ease human suffering, it saves money. You know, I'm almost thinking, Senator Cassidy, that we should change the name of this committee to the Prevention Committee. Because as a nation, what we do is end up spending a fortune after people end up in the emergency room in the hospital rather than keeping them out of it. We treat kids who don't get the quality education they need and they end up in jail. So we should be focusing on prevention. That's certainly what the Older Americans Act is about. If seniors do not get the nutrition they need and seniors become malnourished, what happens to those seniors? Well, if you're malnourished, by definition, you're going to get sick more often than you should. If you're old and you're sick, where do you end up? And you're going to end up in the emergency room at great expense to Medicare and Medicaid. You're going to end up in the hospital at great expense to our health care system. As a matter of fact, malnutrition among seniors today costs our society over $50 billion each and every year, rather an incredible amount of money. Uh, the truth is, it makes a lot more sense to provide adequate nutrition to frail seniors than to spend money on preventable hospital costs. In fact, and I love this number here, it costs less to feed a senior, one senior, for an entire year through the Older Americans Act than it does for a senior to spend one night in a hospital. Feed a senior for a year or spend one night in the hospital. Well, I think it's a better idea to feed that senior. Providing adequate nutrition seniors, uh, new services for seniors also reduces the needs for nursing home care. People would rather stay at home than end up in nursing home, in nursing homes, and that's what uh, Meals on Wheels and other programs do. So bottom line is here, and what is of concern to this committee is since 2016, Despite increased demand and a massive increase in the number of seniors in America, funding for the Older Americans Act has gone down by nearly 20% after adjusting for inflation. 20% right? in real dollars. As a result, seniors who are desperate for nutrition food are being put on waiting lists that can last for months. So we have a choice. Either we're going to respond to the crises facing seniors, adequately fund these programs, or we don't. My strong hope is that we go forward and do the right thing. Senator Cassidy. Thank you, Chairman Sanders. Um, and, and, and two things about your opening comments. Um, it is good that Behringer is going to offer those inhalers at $35. But what we've learned is that when the insulin providers say that they provided an insulin at $35, pharmacy benefit managers wouldn't carry it. Uh, so I think it's incumbent upon us to say, to, to, to get our PBM reform legislation, which we worked on on a bipartisan basis in this committee, signed into law. And that's going to take not just this committee, but the entire Senate and the House Republicans and the House Senate to collaborate. We're not there yet, but anyone that can pick up a phone, call, we need to get that done so that the benefits of that actually occurs as merely being something which, yes, wouldn't it be nice, but it actually doesn't impact someone's life. Secondly, just a typo, and I'm sure it was an oversight, uh, it's good that we've increased the uh, funding for the community health centers. It's $4.27 billion, not $4.4, but it shows what can happen when we actually work together with reasonable numbers and try and make things happen. And that's when this committee is at its best. 
And now returning to the, uh, to the committee at hand and thank our witnesses for being here. I really appreciate it. And one by Zoom, which I wonder why everybody isn't by Zoom, because that would obviously be uh, um, more, more, uh, more efficient. We're discussing the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act, or the OAA, legislation empowering American seniors to live healthy and independent lives in the settings they choose, uh, the, the lifestyle they choose. One of our members of the panel just got her hair dramatically cut said it was a celebration of her 66th birthday. So we see that seniors can live on the wild side. Uh, so I just want to kind of comment on that right off the bat. Um, first enacted in 1965, the OAA provides funding to support essential services to aging Americans through, nutrition, through programs such as nutrition, ca uh, caregiver support, and elder abuse prevention. And we have historically in Congress come together on a bipartisan basis to reauthorize this, strengthening its support for all seniors. Post-COVID, we need to look at and make sure the programs that we're authorizing work. If they're not working, improve them. And make sure that those scarce taxpayer dollars are being put to maximal benefit. How do we build on what works? Replace that which does not. During the pandemic, OAA service providers had to adapt. And I would tour many of those places, seeing how are you doing it differently? And my gosh, they were quick on it. Uh, we should take lessons learned during the pandemic and use that new knowledge as how we can better serve those whom we intend to serve. OAA is a foundation, but it was never meant to meet all needs, and we have to be clear about that. So it's also important to understand how to use public-private partnerships to leverage this funding to expand services beyond the reach of this funding. Today, we will hear about some of those partnerships. Again, thank you for being here. Maximizing the reach of these dollars requires strong organizations on the state and local level. We appropriate, it has to be implemented on the state and local level. So how do we support those state units and those local units to maximize their effect? One of our witnesses today, Secretary Michelle Branham, will, say, will speak to us about how she has successfully done this in Florida, which I think has one of our old, one of our Large, probably the largest population of seniors. Um, she's looking at me. Uh, she's making sure that I don't diss Maine. I understand that Maine's got a lot of seniors. And believe me, I know that, Dr. Senator Collins. But anyway, Florida's just got a bigger population than you. Uh, you got to walk. You got to walk a walk a tightrope around here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> This year, the Health Committee will need to pass legislation reauthorizing the program, and I'm glad to join Chair Sanders in leading a bipartisan working group with Senators Collins, Braun, Mullen, Casey, Kane, and Markey. With this group, with our stakeholders, we're going to come forward with a bipartisan reauthorization, improving the lives of all of those who we call senior citizens. I appreciate the Chair for engaging. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Uh, we have a wonderful panel. Uh, our first witness is uh, Ms. Ramsey Alwyn, the President and CEO of the National Council on Aging. Uh, the National Council on Aging has been a national voice and advocate for older adults since 1950 and provides resources and advocacy to ensure that every person can age with health and financial security. Uh, Ms. Alwyn, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having us, and thank you to the chairman and ranking member for your support, your leadership on this important topic today, and the bipartisan work group that you've initiated together. We greatly appreciate that leadership. For nearly 75 years, the National Council on Aging has operated under the principle that aging well in America should be a right not a privilege for the few. And we applaud the leadership of the chairman for initiating an effort to ensure the Older Americans Act can reach all Americans with an appropriations letter with 41 other senators supporting doubling the support for the program. Thank you for that important leadership. Because we know from our work every day with partners from across the country, helping older adults secure jobs, enroll in programs that can help with food and medicine, and learn how to better manage their chronic conditions and prevent falls, there is more need and demand than ever before. And this reauthorization is an opportunity to strengthen and modernize the act to meet those needs. 
Before I get started on our recommendations, I'd like to share one story of millions that we've collected over the years. Miss West is a family caregiver in her 60s, and she shared with our team, navigating all the challenges my mom has faced these past few years has been difficult. The death of my father, moving in with my husband and I, cancer and surgery, not to mention COVID. Yet, after she had a fall, the local senior center connected us to the capable team. The capable team came into our home with fresh eyes and ears, years of experience and kind hearts. They helped by offering home modification ideas we hadn't thought of and resources we didn't even know existed. Our home is now better equipped to keep my mom safe and we have a plan for the future as her needs increase. She's even gotten involved in the senior center and made some new friends. Ms. West shares, I wish every senior could have the peace of mind all of this has offered us. Stories like this one and so many more inform the recommendations I'll share with you today. We know more than 90% of older adults live in communities. And the Older Americans Act plays a critical role in providing non-medical professional services to ensure all can age well at home. Our priorities for this reauthorization begin with senior centers, which are a time-tested model to deliver on the promise of the act. A visitor to a senior center can come in to exercise, get screened for benefits, take an art class, get a hot meal and socialize, learn a new language, or find purpose through volunteering. Despite all this important work, senior centers face chronic budget shortfalls and are not generally funded by the Older Americans Act. Through reauthorization, Congress has an opportunity to ensure that a modern senior center is available to every American. We must address lessons learned from the pandemic, reinstate a separate title for senior centers, strengthen the authorization for modernizing them, and increase funding for senior nutrition programs to allow for parity between home delivered and congregate meal settings. Our second priority is healthy aging. We know that chronic conditions are the leading cause of frailty, disability, and death in the US. But we also know there are evidence-based programs that make a difference. They save lives and they save money. For instance, participants in that capable program around home modifications to prevent falls, on average, save $30,000 to the health system. Participants in the chronic disease self-management program are shown to save $700 per participant in emergency room and hospital visits. And given that 80% of older adults have two or more chronic conditions, we believe that chronic disease self-management program should be offered and available in every zip code, which is not the case today. Title 3D of the Act supports this work, but funding has not kept pace with the growing needs and costs. To expand reach, reauthorization should double the authorized funding levels for Title 3D and expand the continuum of programs funded to include those that are evidence-formed as well as evidence-based. Our third priority is direct care workforce and the desire for home and community-based services. Funded by ACL, NCOA leads the Direct Care Workforce Strategy Center, which is working to address the workforce shortage crisis with state systems change. We ask that reauthorization strengthen authorities for sustained funding for this center to increase technical assistance and training for states that are looking for creative solutions to build that workforce, given the increase in demand. Finally, the act is critical to ensuring the economic security of older adults, especially those that need and want to continue to work. Since 1968, NCOA has served as a national administrator of the Senior Community Service Employment Program, or CSEP. A Department of Labor program that's authorized and funded under the Act, CSEP is the only federal job training program focused exclusively on helping older Americans return to the workforce. The majority of participants are women and people of color. And the job training provides more than a job. It's dignity, it's purpose, it's security. We advocate for lowering the eligibility for the program from 55 to age 50 and raising the income eligibility from 125% of federal poverty to 200% of the federal poverty level. Reaching people earlier, as well as those on the edge, will enable more to benefit from this successful program, providing them the income, the security, the purpose needed to age well. And they'll continue to be taxpayers. 
In conclusion, the Older Americans Act provides a critical blueprint for ensuring we have the infrastructure needed in our country to support all of us as we age. Now is the time to modernize and strengthen the act to meet the needs of today and tomorrow so that every American, including each of us here today, can age well. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much. Our next witness is Ms. Ellie Hollander, the President and CEO of Meals on Wheels America, which is a national membership organization that represents 5,000 local community-based programs across the country dedicated to improving the nutrition and lives of seniors. Ms. Hollander, thanks so much for being with us. Good morning, Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and esteemed members of the committee. It's an honor to testify before you on such an important topic, and especially during March, the month in 1972 in which the nutrition program was added to the Older Americans Act. Obviously, I am Ellie Hollander, and I'm President and CEO of Meals and Wheels America, and I'm so proud to present, uh, to be, to represent an incredibly dedicated and effective nationwide network of senior nutrition programs, an army of committed staff and volunteers, and the millions of older adults who rely on them as a lifeline. And particularly relevant to the hearing today, I'm driven to amplify the voices of the millions more who would benefit if only we had the resources to reach them, whether in their homes, in senior centers, or in other community settings. There are a few federal programs which exemplify a successful public-private partnership, much less set the gold standard. Congress should take a bow on this one, because the Older Americans Act is just that. It has withstood the, the test of time, and it continues to deliver on its original purpose and intent, improving and even saving lives, and all while reducing taxpayer dollars. The program is appropriately focused on those in the greatest social and economic need, and in return, delivers both a social and an economic benefit, and not many programs can claim that. With that said, we are at a precipice that warrants action, and there is no time to waste. Senior lives hang in the balance. That's because the gap between increasing need and our ability to provide resources continues to widen at an unprecedented rate. And despite critical investments made during the pandemic, we cannot keep up with the demand at current funding levels. Underscoring that point, 12 million seniors struggle with hunger, which is greater than the populations of 44 states in the District of Columbia. 2.5 million low-income food insecure seniors are not receiving the meals for which they are eligible and likely need. Seven out of 10 Meals on Wheels programs report higher demand now than before the pandemic, and one in three has a wait list with an average waiting time of three months for vital meals. The good news is that thanks to the foresight of President Johnson for enacting the Older Americans Act, President Nixon for expanding upon it, and Congress for continuing to invest in it, the infrastructure already exists to solve for this growing gap. That's because local programs have built incredible trust within their communities and developed immense expertise and resilience through nearly six decades of service, including operating through a pandemic. What these programs do on a daily basis is truly remarkable and irreplaceable. And there's more good news. These services offer a significant return on that investment. A recent report, The Case for Meals on Wheels, showed consistent findings from 38 studies that seniors receiving nutritious meals, companionship, and safety and wellness checks, the typical Meals on Wheels service model, experience reductions in hospital visits and stays, healthcare services and costs, nursing home usage, loneliness, and social isolation, falls, food insecurity, and nutritional risk. For perspective, the annual cost of senior falls malnutrition and social isolation exceed $107 billion combined. And lastly, we can provide a senior, as Senator Sanders likes to say, Meals on Wheels for an entire year for the equivalent of roughly one day in the hospital or 10 days in a nursing home. But the best news of all is that Congress has the power to propel a program that has received bipartisan and bicameral support throughout the years because, quite frankly, it works. Congressional support through this reauthorization is an investment in the seniors of today that will improve health, save lives, and reduce costs in the future. To that end, here are three recommendations for your consideration. The first is to increase the authorization funding levels for all Older Americans Act programs to the maximum amount possible. We estimate that a $774 million increase is needed for the nutrition program alone just to close the current services gap. The second is to create a single Title III 
nutrition program, unifying the congregate home delivered and nutrition services incentive programs into one program and funding stream. Local providers have told us repeatedly that this adjustment would improve efficiency and enable them to far more easily tailor services to their seniors. And the third is to prioritize community-based programs in Older Americans Act contracts and grant awards. Our programs provide a holistic service that starts with the meal but opens the door to so much more, leading to better health outcomes. Lastly, as you dig into the reauthorization process, as Senator Sanders did, I'd like to urge you to visit a Meals on Wheels program in your state, if you haven't recently, to go on a meal delivery and to stop by a senior center because seeing is believing. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership on this important issue and for the letter that you and 41 other senators sent signed urging for a doubling of funding for programs authorized under the Older Americans Act. We all share that belief that no seniors should be left hungry or isolated, and I stand ready to help in any way I can. Thank you very much, Ms. Hummer. Uh, our next witness is Dr. Martha Kubik, Professor of Nursing at George Mason University. She will be introduced by Senator Kane. Thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member, for stocking this panel. Four of the five are from Virginia. We don't demand 100%, but this ratio seems very acceptable to me. Um, I will be glad to introduce Dr. Marty Kubik, who's a professor of nursing in the College of Public Health at George Mason University, close by in Fairfax. Uh, Dr. Kubik is a behavioral epidemi epidemiologist and advanced practice nurse with over 20 years of community-based primary care experience as a nurse practitioner. She's extensively researched health promotion and disease preventions across the lifespan with a particular focus on low income and minority populations. And her testimony will focus on a pilot program connecting pre-licensed nursing students with older adults at congregate meal sites in Washington, D.C., and Kentucky. Dr. Kubik, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Kane. I appreciate the introduction. Um, thank you, committee, uh, for allowing me to visit this morning to the committee and share the work and testify about the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. The Congregate Nutrition Services section of the OAA, as you all know, provides seniors a nutritious meal in a familiar and easy to reach community setting. As a result, we have a unique national network of trusting gathering places for seniors. Expanding services at these sites to address the increasingly complex health and social needs of a burgeoning aging population, most with multiple chronic conditions, as has already been noted by many, is one approach to help seniors age well and age in place. As the older adult population continues to boom, Access to primary care health services remains problematic, contributing to poor health outcomes and increased hospitalizations, as has been noted by Dr. Uh, Senator Sanders. Establishing academic practice partnerships between senior centers and dining sites and health profession schools, and particularly schools of nursing, to bring students to the community sites to provide health services holds great potential to improve health outcomes while at the same time preparing a health workforce better equipped to meet the needs of community residing adults for years to come. My funding partner, the National Foundation to End Senior Hunger, recent, recently supported two proof of concept studies that I've led, one here in the District of Columbia that we completed last year, and the other in Eastern Kentucky, which is currently ongoing and will wrap up May of 2024. Both were conducted in partnership with district or state level departments of aging, community nonprofits here in the district, area agencies on aging in Kentucky, senior centers and dining sites, six per each of the locations for a total of 12, and local nursing programs, two at each location for a total of four. Health, the um, faculty supervised pre-licensure nursing students, so students studying to be registered nurses, typically in their last year of studies, deliver the program that we call AgeWell once weekly for six to 12 weeks at five of the 12 sites that we randomly selected. Health services included one-on-one -on -one visits between a senior and a nursing student with a focus on medication management, blood pressure assessment, and health coaching guided by the seniors' priorities and goals. 
Other services delivered in an interactive group setting were focused primarily on healthy eating strategies and physical activity. Across sites, both in the district and in Kentucky, nursing student engagement and program participation and satisfaction among seniors has been high. Outcomes are pending in Kentucky. In the district, most of the seniors who participated in the AgeWell program self-reported improved diets and increased physical activity. Blood pressure that we measured before and after we delivered the AgeWell program across all six sites, not just the sites where we delivered the program, demonstrated a 5.9 millimeter of mercury decrease in systolic blood pressure. So we were able to lower the top number of the blood pressure by six points that favored the age well group. While this was not a statistically significant difference in our study, likely due to the small sample size and the pilot nature, it is nonetheless very promising and merits further study. In closing, our study results support feasibility, acceptability, and potential of the age well program to improve chronic disease self-management for seniors. The time is right to expand services for the older adults that access community dining sites and senior centers and the congregate meal program. In reauthorizing the OAA, we encourage the committee to include support for further study of the age well approach so as to assess program effectiveness on health comes, such as blood pressure, and also scalability. Thank you for your opportunity to speak today, and I'm happy to answer questions. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kubik. Uh, our next witness is Ms. Dorothy Hutchins from Alexandria, Virginia, and Senator Kane is going to introduce her fellow Virginian. Thank you, Chairman, and Ms. Hudgens, it's so great to see you. Dorothy Hudgens is 93 years old, and she joins us virtually from her home in nearby Alexandria. Dorothy's had a full life, and her testimony, we're going to hear about her career as a geologist and her journey raising five children, 17 grandchildren, and now 27 great-grandchildren. She receives Older Americans Act services through one of our state's regional area agencies on aging, the, Fa the Fairfax Agency on Aging. This network of the agencies does superb work. And the services that she receives, like socialization provided at senior centers and nutritious meals through Meals on Wheels, help her remain independent in her own home. Uh, Ms. Hudgens, it's great to have you here with us today. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Unmute. I'm glad to be of help. My name is Dorothy Hudgens. In July, I will be 94 years old. Ms. Hudgens, we're still old. having a hard time hearing you. I don't know whether it's your end or our end. Try again. It's not coming through. Nope. My name is Dorothy Hutchins. In July, I will be 94 years old. I live alone, but I'm blessed to have a large yeah. supportive family. And, and Ms. Children, Hutchins has uh, uh, some kind of staff assistant there with her. Uh, perhaps, Mr. Chair, we should move to the uh, fifth witness and then circle back to Ms. Hutchins. Should we try that? I, th I think staff assistance is a euphemism for grandchild. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, uh, if only I could get assistance. All right. Until from we relative. get back to uh, Ms. Hutchins, let's go to our final witness, uh, who is Ms. Michelle Branham. Uh, she'll be recognized uh, by Senator Cassidy. Yeah. A pleasure to introduce Secretary Michelle Branham, appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis to serve as the agency head for the Florida <laughs> Department of Elder Services in December 2021. And under her leadership, the department serves Florida's 6.3 million seniors over the age of 60, providing services and supporting initiatives through Florida's aging network to help those seniors live well and to age well in their state. And prior to that, I could just go through a whole list of ways that she has been involved serving those with Alzheimer's, addressing the needs, understanding, otherwise, helping our society as a whole address Alzheimer's. So, S Secretary Branham, thank you for being with us. Thank you, sir. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, esteemed committee members, and fellow panelists, I truly appreciate the opportunity to discuss how Florida champion seniors 
and the important role of the Older Americans Act in supporting our cherished elders. And I spent my first year and a half as secretary on the road in the senior centers and adult day centers, working with our providers, as we've all mentioned. It's really exciting for us to share our story because as we may already know, we're either seniors or we're seniors in the making. And if we're blessed to continue aging, it's imperative that we provide not only the seniors now, but the seniors of tomorrow, the brightest and best possible future. Florida remains a top destination for seniors, as you mentioned, with over 6.3 million residents aged 60 and above. We rank among the nation's fastest growing and the third most populous state. And as the Secretary of the Florida Department of Elder Affairs, I'm truly grateful for Governor Ron DeSantis' ongoing and steadfast commitment to prioritizing our seniors. At our agency, we take great pride in leading the charge and ensuring the dignity, independence, and fulfillment of seniors in Florida. Serving as the designated standalone state unit on aging, and that's a distinction that not many states have, our goal is to provide an environment where seniors can maintain their independence, within their homes for as long as possible, thereby creating a happier, healthier lifestyle while also promoting fiscal responsibility as aging in place is considerably more cost effective. And under the leadership of Governor DeSantis, Florida excels nationally in addressing Alzheimer's and other related dementias. With pioneering initiatives, a first of the nation mobile outreach program and significant state funding each year, thus reflecting our commitment to those impacted by, by Alzheimer's and related dementia. And you just said, Senator Cassidy, that is near and dear to my heart. Our agency oversees $511 million in state and federal funding, and that's including $154 million from the Older Americans Act, aiming to enable older adults to age well and live well in the place of their choosing, thus contributing to Florida's vibrant communities through our collective efforts with our aging network. As you know, the OAA tailors a range of services designed for seniors and caregivers, and these include, for us, in-home and community-based support services to address cognitive decline, individual needs, fostering social connections, and ultimately reducing the impact of uh, uh, loneliness, isolation, and depression. This approach has resulted in significant increased participation in our various programs and senior centers all across Florida. And while the department continues to review the new OAA rule and its potential impact, I urge Congress and HHS to consider continuing to collaborate closely with states to ensure these new regulations do not unnecessarily hinder the process, especially in Florida over the past three decades. So now I'm just gonna hit a few of the high points for the Older Americans Act in Florida. Over our entire state, we are witnessing increased participation in senior centers, congregate meal sites, and adult day centers. Last year alone, we provided more than 10 million meals in Florida served through OAA. Supplemental services are also available in, available in Florida to caregivers of vulnerable individuals 60 and older and grandparents that are pro providing care for grandchildren. Other types of services include home repairs, chore, assistant, respite care, and specialized support for elders with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And one of my favorite programs, I know we mentioned it, was the Senior Community Center Service Employment Program. And that helps older Floridians who face challenges in the job market or re-entering the job market. And the wonderful part of this program is that due to workforce shortages, it also helps fill essential gaps in Florida's job market with our vibrant seniors. So I absolutely love this program. Our centralized long-term care ombudsman program, among other programs, plays a pivotal role in safeguarding our seniors from abuse, neglect, fraud, and exploitation. And this wonderful volunteer-based program works tirelessly to protect, defend, and advocate for Florida seniors living in the state's 4,000 long-term care communities. So in summary, Florida is proud to be the most senior-friendly state in the country with the Older Americans Act serving as one of the most critical keystones of Florida's efforts to support and protect Floridians as they continue to age. As Secretary of the Department of Elder Affairs, I've seen firsthand how our governor has shown unwavering dedication to seniors from his time in Congress all the way through the groundbreaking initiatives as governor like our Dementia Action Plan and the Florida Alzheimer's Center of Excellence. He's reinforced training standards for senior care, increased funding for our memory disorder clinics throughout the state, and enacted comprehensive reforms to Florida's pre prescription drug, drug market. 
Florida, under his leadership, remains at the forefront of next generation initiatives, program explorations, critical funding, executive and legislative support, and collective research that promotes not only aging, but aging well for all residents of the Sunshine State. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it appears that the technical problems with Ms. Hutchins were at our end, <laughs> not at her end. And so with that, we welcome back uh, Ms. Hutchins. My name is Dorothy Hutchins. In July, I will be 94 years old. I live alone, but I'm blessed to have a large supportive family. I have five children, 17 grandchildren, and 27 great-grandchildren. I started my career in the 1952 as a young geologist, part of the women's auxiliary geologists at the time with the geological survey. I wrote gemstones of the, I wrote gemstones of the United States under my maiden name, Dorothy Schlegel in 1956. One highlight of my career was mapping the Verde Quadrangle in the deserts of Arizona. When my husband passed away in 1973, I retired from geology and stayed home with my family. I benefited from services under the Older Americans Act since the early 1990s. I attended two different local senior centers. Lincolnia in Alexandria and Bailey's in Falls Church. I was able to drive myself. At the senior centers, I would play bridge, take exercise classes, eat lunch with my peers, and participate in events on holidays and special occasions. The work they do is so important and should be available to all seniors. I stopped attending the senior centers during COVID. During that time, I found out that I was eligible to receive meals delivered to my home. On Thursdays, six frozen dinners and six lunches are delivered to my home. The same young woman from Peru comes every week and we chat a little. The food meets my needs and is sometimes more than I can eat in one sitting. I fell and hurt my hip in January 2021 and had surgery one week later. After rehab, I came home and walked with a walker. Almost exactly one year later, I fell again and had another surgery and rehab. I've had to be very cautious since my falls. I don't wear shoes in my home. I wear a life alert around my neck and only shower when someone is in the house with me. I'm fortunate to receive occupational and physical therapy in my home. I've since stopped driving and can no longer attend the senior centers. I do get a little lonely. I lost my husband early in our marriage and I'm an only child. Most of my friends are dead. I have one friend in Syracuse and a senior living commit community, but she pays $8,000 each month, and I can't afford that. I used to go to church every week, but I don't go to church anymore in person. I am able to watch it on my tablet. I stay busy and like to learn. I have a friend across the street who brings me the New York Times and Wall Street Journal every day, and I get the Washington Post. I have plenty to read. I also do the crosswords and watch a lot of TV. I've been in my home for 61 years, thanks to my family's support and services provided to me by the Fairfax Area Agency on Aging. I'm able to be independent and continue to live in my own home. I'm also blessed not to have serious health problems. Everyone deserves a chance to live where they choose. And for most of us, we want to remain in our home and communities. The services provided under the Older American Act make that possible for me 
and many other seniors. I hope that Congress will continue su to support this important work. Thank you, and I'm have to, happy to answer your questions. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Hutchins, and we apologize for the technical problems, and you're a great witness. We appreciate it. Um, now we begin our round of questions. And let me start off with a very simple one to all of the expert panelists who are here, and Ms. Hutchins can jump in as well. What all of you have discussed is that we have a growing senior population. We have millions of seniors who have hunger issues, literally some dealing with malnutrition. We have people who are staying home who are lonely, who are isolated. We have people who are falling, causing serious injuries. Do any of you doubt that investing in prevention, I mean, this is America. I mean, we shouldn't have be talking about the need to keep seniors from going hungry. That should be a given, I would hope, in the wealthiest country on earth. When we talk about doubling funding for the Older Americans Act, yeah, we're talking about $2 billion, a lot of money. Do any of you doubt that that investment will not end up saving taxpayers' money by preventing hospitalizations or nursing home uh, visitation, nursing home care when people want to stay at home? Let me start with Ms. Alwyn, uh, and we'll go right down the line. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question, and thank you for elevating the issue. For over 55 years, the Older Americans Act has demonstrated a unique ability to provide these robust services and frankly protect and enhance some of the other federal resources. The preventative service means savings for Medicare and Medicaid. And on average, the Older Americans Act funding represents less than one third of 1% of all federal discretionary spending. And yet the return on investment is amazing. The local and state providers leverage other state resources, local resources, philanthropic, as well as volunteers, providing services annually to over 11 million older adults right, and their caregivers. My question is, stay on the question. So let's double. Is the investment going to save money? It's absolutely going to save money. OK. Ms. Hollander? 100%. Absolutely the best investment that we can make. It's, it's a program that has worked, and it's continuing to keep people out of emergency departments, readmissions, admissions, and premature nursing home placements. It's a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. You invest more, you'll get a huge return on that investment. All right, while you have the mic, let me ask you this. Uh, in Vermont and I think around the country, there are waiting lines to get into uh, the uh, uh, Meals on Wheels program. Can you say a word about that? Well, the waiting list, because you know the resources aren't there, uh, programs are doing their very best to, if they need to, cut back, scale back, so they can serve more seniors in need. But the fact is, is that the resources have never kept pace. You mentioned that earlier about the reduction 20% over time. Um, and the population is growing and we have never really adjusted for inflation. With the pandemic, of course, everything's more expensive. All, all the things that are required to prepare, to deliver, to procure me meals and food to, to do it. But I think the other thing I just want to mention real quick is it isn't just about the meal, right? It's about those people that are, that are needing to have socialization, social connectedness. Um, both of those have Okay, savings. I wanted to go down the line. Thanks very much, Ms. Halda. Dr. Kubik. Yes, um, Senator Sanders, there's no question that um, preventing an issue is, is preferred over waiting until an issue occurs. Um, unfortunately, our healthcare delivery system has mostly been set up to respond to right. uh, conditions rather than prevent. But as a public health professional, there's no question in my mind that uh, continued support of the OAA for food, nutrition, and extended services is exactly what our seniors and our growing population of seniors need in order to stay home and age well and age in place. Thank you. Ms. Brannon, does investing in prevention save money long term? Uh, thank you, Senator Sanders. I think for us, we just went through a workshop with our area agencies on aging. So I think maximizing the dollars that we have is something that is critical to me. So making sure that our aging network knows how to spend, has the ability to spend, and the confidence to spend. So right now, we're focusing on maximizing the dollars that we do have. And I do think interventions are very helpful. Okay. Let me say a word. I have visitors. I think probably every senator here has uh, senior centers and congregate meal programs. I love them. 
Uh, are they getting the resources they need uh, to pay for the meals that they serve? Uh, Ms. Allen? Sure. With 12,000 people turning 65 every day, there's increasing demand. And as was shared, it's tough to keep up with the cost of inflation. There's growing demand. There are growing costs. And so we need to elevate the support and funding both for congregate meals and home delivered. Right, there is not enough support. All right. My time is expiring. Last question. Uh, in Vermont, we have some senior centers that are doing really great. Uh, some are really struggling in the rural areas. They just don't have the funding. Do we have the network of senior centers all over this country, the robust network that we need to satisfy the needs of seniors in general? Who wants to answer that one? Well, yeah. Thank you, Senator. We have the network, 11,000 senior centers, but there is no designated funding stream for senior centers. A third, if they're fortunate, receive dollars from the Area Agency on Aging, a third from Parks and Recreation, and the final third are left to their own devices to fundraise and scrape resources together. So the quality of services, the options available, varies greatly by your zip code. It doesn't have to be that way. Okay, thank you very much. Senator Cassidy. I defer to Senator Collins. Thank you very much, Dr. Cassidy. Dr. Kubik, an issue that we, the panel has not discussed, but which Mrs. Hutchins brought up, is the problem of falls among our seniors. And this often starts a spiral of downward health and is very serious. The Older American Acts, Title Five or Four, I guess it is, does provide some funding to try to support um, health, independence, and longevity activities. And I know in the state of Maine, the Arusa County Area Agency on Aging offers classes called A Matter of Balance, which is evidence-based. And the Bank or Y also offers similar courses. Can you tell me how important it is for us to try to ensure that there is funding to support programs to prevent falls, which can have such devastating consequences. Yes, thank you, Senator Collins, for the question. Um, I think as our guest from Alexandria indicated, uh, two falls, two years in a row, and with uh, good health care, good medical care, good support at home from an occupational therapist, likely a physical therapist, she's been able to stay at home. But again, as as we bump up the number of uh, the number of us who are over the age of 65, who are having um, varying levels of decline physically, if we can prevent and maintain mobility, if we can maintain safe mobility, if we can, um, what the nursing students have done with the seniors is they take them for a walk. They accompany them on a walk. And during those accompanying walks, you can talk about safety. You can talk about preventing falls. We also uh, implemented foot care at all the clinics. So if you can take care of your feet, you have a firmer base to walk on, which is often overlooked when we go to primary care offices. So I think it's critical that we work and prioritize fall prevention among our seniors. Thank you. Secretary Branham, welcome. We've worked together on Alzheimer's disease uh, in the past, and it's good to see you today. I want to talk about another issue that has been alluded to but not focused on, and that is the problem of widespread loneliness among American seniors. We know that that poses health risks that are as deadly as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Mm -hmm. Social isolation and loneliness have been estimated to shorten a person's lifespan by as many as 15 years. And loneliness and isolation have also been linked to cognitive decline and an increased risk of dementia. That problem was exacerbated during the pandemic. But even before the pandemic, approximately one in four older Americans suffered from loneliness. We tried to respond to this in the 2020 reauthorization of the Older American Acts, of which I was a uh, co-author. 
but I'm interested in hearing from you what more we could do. Congregate, um, congregate feeding areas, um, meals obviously help. Visits from home health nurses help enormously uh, to have wellness checks, but also checking in. Delivery of meals on wheels helps. But what else would you suggest? Oh, thank you for the question, Senator Collins, and I loved working with you. Um, I think um, that is a major issue in spending so much time in the field, seeing these vibrant senior centers open um, with music and congregating and being together and taking Tai Chi classes and mobility classes for falls prevention, um, learning new things, uh, learning IT, all of that has done a tremendous job in improving because isolation, loneliness, and depression is something that we saw even with our most vulnerable population to a degree that was just so sad. Um, and I think there's so much more that we can do. So we talked about the companionship care, not just delivering a meal, but sitting there, talking with the person, making that meal more of an opportunity and event than just putting something down there. So that's been tremendous. Even with the more flexibility with OAA, being able to grab and go and taking that home and maybe sitting down with a person in a park, uh, having those capabilities and flexibilities with the new OAA rule has been significant and our area agencies on aging love that. But I think making sure that we have senior centers that are vibrant, adult day centers that are vibrant, um, help to mitigate the impact of isolation, loneliness, and depression. And there's absolutely more that we can continue to do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Collins. Uh, Senator Casey. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much for calling this hearing. I want to thank you and Ranking Member Cassidy for the work that goes into and your team's work to the planning of this hearing. Of course, I want to thank our witnesses and thank uh, both the committee leadership as well as our witnesses for uplifting the Older Americans Act, uh, a landmark piece of legislation that a lot of Americans only hear about um, every few years. So it's important for us to uplift it and celebrate how important it is, but also to make sure that we get this reauthorization right. As chairman of the Senate Aging Committee, I've worked on a bipartisan basis with colleagues over many years now to reauthorize the Older Americans Act before, and, and I'm working again. And I'm grateful to be at the negotiating table once more to begin this reauthorization process. I think we can all agree, despite all of our divisions in the Senate and the House, I think we can all agree that older Americans deserve to age with dignity. And it's our obligation. It's not, it's not optional. It's an obligation to make sure that we're doing everything possible to make, make that a reality. I wanted to start with, with Ms. Alwyn and, and uh, Ms. Hollander about the question of the, a strategic plan for aging. As you both know, our population is aging so rapidly, and your testimony highlights that reality. Local communities and states uh, still need to be able to provide more services and more supports to older adults in the years ahead. We've heard testimony already, Ms. Hollander, about your good work at Meals on Wheels and Ms. Alwyn on the National Council on Aging. Both pro provide invaluable services for older adults and are critical to supporting our uh, older adults as it continues to age. Across the country, states, including my home state of Pennsylvania, have been working on multi-sector so-called multi-sector or master plans for aging. These plans bring stakeholders, both public and private stakeholders together to coordinate service delivery and transform infrastructure to better meet the needs of our aging population. I recently introduced with Senator Gillibrand the Strategic Plan for Aging Act. Our bill would provide funding for states that are developing or implementing these long-term care or long-term plans, I should say, for aging. We want to thank both Meals on Wheels and, and NCOA for your endorsement of the bill. I'll, I'll be pushing to include this legislation in the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. I start with Ms. Alwyn. How could long-term planning and improved coordination across all levels of government better support states, local providers, and, of course, the older adults that they serve? 
Well, thank you, Senator. Thank you for the question and for your leadership with the Special Committee on Aging and with the important legislation that really elevates lessons from these multi-sector plans. We applaud that good innovation going on across the country and recognize there's an opportunity to pull that through into the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. Because aging well means addressing all the domains of aging well. And long-term planning around all the domains as the multi-sector plans have initiated is really an important step to make the most of the limited resources available and coordinate across federal, state, and local uh, administering agencies. We also applaud the great work of the Administration on Community Living for leveraging the Interagency uh, Coordinating Council opportunity already made available through the Act, really modeling that federal coordination across the various departments that states have initiated with the multi-sector plans. When those conversations and those stakeholders are around the same table, we can have thoughtful conversations about the demographic trends and provide more preventative services and supports, bringing in a greater savings ultimately and improving the quality of life. Thank you. Ms. Hollander? I think Ramsey did a nice job of summarizing the benefit of that. I would say from someone who's actually going through a strategic planning process for my own organization, I know how uh, important it is to make sure that there's alignment, that all the stakeholders are at the table, and that you're creating um, a plan that is flexible and adaptable because we have a very rapidly changing uh, demographic in our country. It's an explosion, as you know. We've just been talking about the senior population. But there's also far greater diversity, and we need to have plans at the state level that are able to flex to that change. I would just say that one of the things I think is really important is rather than having individual plans, there has to be some opportunity to look for cross-state uh, cross cross synergies to be able to leverage those synergies, those, le those learnings, but also to bubble up where there are gaps so that at the national level there's symbiotic uh, you know, planning between what's happening at the national level, what's happening at state levels. And I only want to caution that, to say that we need to have people at the table that are sharing that information across. And I would also say one more thing, which is a plan is a living document. And what we can't do is put all our time into developing a plan. What we have to make sure is part of that is making sure that we're accountable for delivering on that plan, tracking that plan, and making sure that we make adjustments along the way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to you and the ranking member for holding this hearing. To all of our witnesses, thank you very much for your excellent testimony. Mrs. Hutchins, I wanted to start with a question for you. I want to highlight the epidemic of loneliness in our country, which, as we've been talking about, especially impacts older Americans. A recent study shows that more than one in three older adults report feeling lonely or socially isolated. Loneliness not only has negative impacts on mental health, but can also lead to increased risk for dementia, heart disease, and stroke. Mrs. Hutchins, you talked about your challenges of, with loneliness, about your personal experience with it. What tools and supports do you find most helpful in combating social isolation? I'm thinking. <laughs> Um, yeah, I <clears throat> I have periods of loneliness, but I've lived a long, very interesting life, right. and I have many wonderful memories that I fall back on when I get lonely. And I, of course, talk on the phone to my family and my one friend who's up in Syracuse, mm -hmm. and. Um, I, and I watch certain programs on TV, and I make it through the day. And I'm just grateful to have my son and my grandson stopping in from time to time, and uh, uh, it's and my church. Yep. Um, I, I just try the best I can to to make it through the day. But right. I'm, I have not been depressed, so I just, if I feel a little low, I'll just um, think of some wonderful thing that's happened to me in the past, yep. and that gets me over it. But most of the time, I'm in good spirits. 
Well, that's excellent. And I think what one of the things you're really describing is the importance of that social interaction, even if it's just by phone or seeing people. And really having that connection is very important. Oh, yes. I enjoyed the senior center so much. I went for 20 years to Lincolnia. Yeah. Played bridge, um, art classes. Uh, I even volunteered on the desk. And uh, it was very rewarding. I was there at least three days a week. Well, thank and you. Their meals were very good, too. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. I want to turn to Secretary Branham now. Um, one way to address loneliness is to create more opportunities for social connection across different generations. Our, one senior community in Hanover, New Hampshire, called Kendall at Hanover, hosts a daycare and early education program for children up to six years old. This model, also called intergenerational care, gives seniors the opportunity to volunteer in the classroom and participate in social activities with uh, very young students. For residents who enter the facility alone or who are experiencing health issues and may be more prone to social isolation, volunteering in the classroom and interacting with the kids has become their favorite part of the day. Intergenerational programs can obviously benefit both of our seniors and our young people by giving them opportunities to build new relationships and learn from each other. So Secretary, can you speak to how intergenerational care programs like this can be useful in combating loneliness? Yes, thank you, Senator. Well, I love our senior volunteer program. First, uh, here at the department, we have seniors providing care for seniors, so a lot of yeah. companionship care, and I absolutely love that volunteer program. We have so many testimonies from across the state of that because it's more than just, like I said, dropping off a meal. It's taking time to read or bake cookies and spend time. But on the intergenerational side, I think it's really exciting because through the First Lady of Florida's initiative, we have a mentoring program. So seniors mentoring children at risk, children in the elementary school system, and children graduating out of foster care who need assistance. Right. And I think that intergenerational connection has been a win-win, both for the people, the, the young people, the families surrounding them, and the seniors. So it's been really exciting to watch that. Well, excellent, thank you. And finally, to Ms. Alwyn, um, I wanna focus a little bit on family caregivers who obviously play such a central role in caring for loved ones. Congress recognized the key role of family caregivers when it added the Family Caregiver Support Program to the Older Americans Act in 2000. It's critical that we reauthorize and build on the caregiver resources provided through the Older Americans Act to ensure that families have the support that they need. That's why I joined my colleagues in pushing for policies that support caregivers, such as the Credit for Caring Act, which would give much needed tax relief to family caregivers. What are the other ways, Ms. Alwyn, that Congress can support family caregivers? Fabulous. Well, thank you for your leadership in introducing that important legislation, Senator. There are many different actions Congress can place, and we are supporters of the RAISE Coalition and the incredible release of the National Family Caregiver Strategy, where there are over 350 actions Great. that can be taken by federal agencies already today to better support family caregivers. So many of the services and supports provided by the Older Americans Act help those family caregivers. Yeah. So reauthorizing the Older Americans Act doubling the funding so those services and supports, including respite care, are available to family caregivers is critical. Well, thank you very much. And I would um, add my support for respite services. They're really, really important. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Senator Cassidy. Thank you, Chairman Sanders. Hey, thank you all for being here. Really a great mission. Ms. Hutchison, you kind of inspire us all to live that better life. Um, uh, Secretary Branham, um, believe me, I just, I just met with some fast food folks. They're talking about the cost of labor. Um, we know that inflation has really bit, uh, I'm sure it's bit your, bu your budget too. And yet with all this growing population, you're expanding services. Clearly you're collaborating with others. Can you speak about that collaboration? What are best practices? Something that we just, uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, something that we just did is um, our CSEP program out of OAA has been connected to Career Source. So CSEP program, please, for everybody watching who doesn't know uh, acronyms. Yes, it's the C Senior Community Employment Program. We love our acronyms. Um, so that program has been really paramount for us because it takes seniors back into the workforce, educates and trains them, pays them while we're doing it and then really um, helps with the gaps in service that we're seeing in Florida. Now we've 
added that CSEP program, those seniors that are in the program, into Career Source Florida so that we can really look at all the gaps a across all of the industries in Florida. So if you will, you're not competing for the person who might be doing lawn work out there, but rather you're taking a group of folks who would have maybe more empathy with, with, the, with the clientele and you're giving them another chance at employment. Yes, sir, and usually I see through our CSET program, it's seniors helping seniors, and they traditionally go into the social work environment, which I really enjoy watching. Yeah, now, this is a different committee, but do you run into problems with the retirement earnings test in which they get a decrease in their Social Security payment if they go back to work? Are you familiar with that? No, sir, okay. I'm not. Dr. Kubik, uh, I'm a doc. I love the idea that you are using, you're finding the win-win-win, if you will. Elaborate a little bit on that, please. I definitely agree it's a mutually beneficial partnership. Um, I think that we can do so much more to connect our health profession students to our seniors and our aging population. At this point, their exposure is mostly when that person is in the emergency room or in the hospital, very vulnerable, very frail. Uh, most of our seniors are not frail. Most of them are wanting to stay at home, wanting to be successful, wanting to be healthy, wanting to be productive, wanting to be able to go and visit with their friends uh, and socialize. Now, did I hear you correctly that you've lowered systolic blood pressure yes. by 20 points? Uh, six points almost. Six points. Yep. As you know, most, uh, most of the high blood pressure we get when we get older is the top number. Our systolic blood pressure goes up. That's the top number. Yep. And yep. the, the diastolic's the bottom number for people who... Right. So we lowered that top number by almost six points in the group that received the age well program. Now, did you do that just by making sure they were compliant, by looking at their diet and making sure they weren't eating Fritos for breakfast, that kind of thing? <laughs> no. Um, you know, the, the intervention, the work that we did with the nursing students, it wasn't just one thing. Uh, it was a lot of medication management. Every week they were there, they were checking blood pressures. We were writing blood pressures down. We were encouraging them to take their list to their healthcare provider. We were getting up and walking with them. So it wasn't just showing them exercise. It was taking them and exercising with them. So in my opinion, it was all that coming together. Uh, you know, in our work, most of our seniors were taking three to five medications or more every day. Uh, whether they needed all those medications or not is something that we need to look further into, but it's a challenge to manage all these chronic conditions that they have. So I think the feedback and the engagement that they were having with the nursing students was an incentive to um, perhaps eat better, to be more active. Now, by the way, and I forget again if it was you or Ms. Hutchison because uh, I forget, but, but I think one of you said something about making sure that you minimize the risk for falls I think about these throw rugs that, that right. are easy to slip upon and somebody breaks their hip. Exactly. Um, or fall and That's right. Uh, let the record show I slapped my head. And so <laughs> if nothing else, you're creating that awareness among those yes. who are. So a comment on that, please. Well, I think it's, again, um, that one-on-one -on -one engagement between the senior and the nursing student allowed the senior to prioritize concerns, but it also provided the, the nursing student an opportunity to provide prompts. You know, tell me about safety in your home. Tell me about how you manage moving around your furniture and cooking and uh, storing and putting things away. Uh, next week when you come back, let's talk about that some more. That's the other opportunity that the nursing I'm almost students... out of time, but I started off speaking about a partnership with an outside agency that would actually extend and leverage the dollars, and then you just gave us another great example of how that's actually training our next generation of nursing students. So, so thank you both and thank you all. Senator Markey. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my mother had Alzheimer's. My father was a milkman. My mother was president of the senior class. So my father said, Eddie, it was an honor that your mother married me. She's a brilliant woman. Um, and um, she has Alzheimer's, there's something wrong, shows you that the strongest brains can be attacked. So we're going to keep her in the living room. That's going to be our job, Eddie. She's never going to go to a nursing home at age 80, 82, 84, 86, 88, 90. And he was a milkman. So the right arm of a milkman is like my upper thigh. Okay? He could do it. But, um, but it's hard. And so all we had is a visiting nurse one hour a day. 23 hours, we had her in the living room. Very difficult. So with Senator Wyden, I created a program called Independence at Home to help people with chronic um, illnesses to have the dignity of staying in their 
um, in their homes. And Ms. Branham, can you share how the Older American Act in Home Services and Outreach Programs for individuals with Alzheimer's and others uh, can provide for their families at home. Thank you, Senator Markey, for the question. And touching my heart, um, I spent 10 years at the Alzheimer's Association alongside people living with the disease and their caregivers, some of the most courageous people I've ever witnessed. Um, yes, I think living at home and being able to stay at home is the best possible concept for someone living with dementia. Uh, but it's really hard to do that by yourself. And I, I applaud your father for doing that. So having those wraparound services is not something that just the OAA provides. But here in Florida, the Alzheimer's Disease Initiative is something that we fund. It has increased funding each year for to supplement OAA for services like that. Because staying at home and wrapping around care and services, not just for the person living with the disease, but the caregiver too, is really, really significant. Yeah, and, uh, and again, you know, two-thirds of Alzheimer's patients are women. It's a one-third, two-third split. Yes. Okay, so there's a lot of work to be done to figure out what's going on here uh, because women are the caregivers, you know, in general is a reverse, and there aren't enough men, you know, to can do that for all those women. So I led my colleagues in writing to the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Social Security Administration asking them to make it easier for seniors and people with disabilities applying for Social Security benefits to also get SNAP benefits. My goal is to make sure that because they didn't know they could get help or got mixed up trying to fill out their paperwork. Ms. Hollander, in your testimony, you mentioned that over four in five low-income food insecure are not receiving the meals that they are eligible because of long wait lists. Meanwhile, you noted that various funding streams with different requirements and standards can make it very hard for nutrition service providers to partner with others in the community and tailor older Americans' meals to their specific health needs. Can you elaborate on that and what has to be done in order to make sure that we make it easy for people to get access? Thank you for the question, Senator Markey. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're talking about a, a, an older population that generally, you know, 76 on average, um, most of whom are women, as a matter of fact, and I think some of the, um, for example, SNAP applications and so forth is a little more complicated for them than it is for others. But I actually, Senator Casey left, but I think he put forward a, uh, recently an act to, to help facilitate that process, the Senior Hunger Prevention Act. Um, but I think just generally speaking, making sure that we have people that are working with seniors that are familiar with all of the various benefits that might be el that may be eligible for is very important and making sure they're educated to do so. Thank you. And Ms. Allman, finally, um, how would mechanisms within existing Older Americans Act programs to support underserved populations like LGBTQ older adults help us meet their unique health and social needs? Absolutely. So to keep pace with the growing number of older adults and the greater diversity among older adults, we need to modernize and strengthen and fully fund the Older Americans Act. But those senior centers really are a front door to all resources and services available for all older adults, including LGBTQ plus older adults. And making sure we have the right mechanisms in place to help support building the capacity of those senior centers sharing promising practices, providing technical assistance, and designated funding so they can build their relevance and capacity and culturally competent programming is critical. Yeah, and the Congress is the right place to be because the secret plan for every single senator is to live to be a very old person. Okay, so we're completely you know, into your agenda to make sure that we help that population. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My understanding is that Senator Baldwin is on her way, so I'm going to give her two more minutes, and I'll take a minute and give a minute to Senator Cassidy just to ask another question. I, I think the average American would be stunned to learn that millions of seniors are dealing with hunger issues, are going hungry, that we have actually malnutrition uh, in America today. I mean, that's rather a, an astounding reality. Ms. Hollander or Ms. Alman, do you want to say a word on hunger among seniors in America? Well, it is a silent ep epidemic. That's part of the challenge is that it's behind closed doors. And one of the things that we have to do is we have to amplify the fact that this is a grave and growing issue. 
um, and we, we have the infrastructure to do it. One of the things I neglected to mention earlier when you asked the question about funding is that this is a, a successful public-private partnership for every federal dollar that comes in through the Older Americans Act. It's matched by about $3 by private and state local sources. And so, you know, even though we're making investments, it is not carrying the full freight of what we're asking. It is actually attracting additional funding to do that. Thank you. Senator Cassidy, you want to take a minute? Ms. Hutchins, um, tell me, you are a recipient. You've received meals both, I gather, going to some place, so-called congregate, and you've had meals delivered to, to you. Would you have any suggestions as to how to make either of those programs a better program? You're on. You? Oh, go, I'm sorry. Good. I'm very challenged by the meals on wheels. I would never be able to have all those vegetables. I sometimes took them in and did. I took a chicken number. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let me thank all of our panelists. You did a great job. We look forward to working with you on this enormously important issue. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from our second panel. For this panel is Ms. Allison Barkoff, the Acting Administrator and Assistant Secretary for Aging. Ms. Barkoff leads the Administration for Community Living. The Administration's mission is to maximize the independence, well-being, and health of older adults, people with disabilities across the lifespan, and their families and caregivers. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today, Acting Administrator. You may proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the Older Americans Act and for the committee's long-standing support of the Older Americans Act programs and healthy aging. I'm Allison Barkoff, the Principal Deputy Administrator and Senior Official performing the duties of Administrator and Assistant Secretary for Aging. I'm pleased to share information today about our work to strengthen OAA programs and the aging services network that implements them, which ultimately will help ensure our nation's ability to meet the needs of older adults. OAA programs help older adults age in place as the vast majority want to do. They provide meals, family caregiver support, preventative health services, personal care services, transportation, senior centers, legal assistance, elder abuse prevention, long-term care ombudsman services, and so much more. These programs reach nearly one in four, five older adults who tell us in survey after survey that OAA programs help them stay in their own homes. These effective programs are an incredible value. With OAA dollars, the aging network leverages another three to four from other sources to support OAA programs. For the next 20 years, 10,000 people, the population of a small town, will turn 65 
every single day. So helping people age in place and avoid more costly institutional care will only become more important. For nearly 60 years, the structure of the OAA has driven its success. It sets broad policy, but gives the aging network the flexibility to meet local needs. We saw the power of that during the pandemic. The network pivoted quickly and creatively, working with us to use the OAA's flexibilities to continue services. They created contactless service options, grab and go meals, and more. They increased coordination and forged new partnerships with public health, emergency management, and others, while ACL partnered with agencies across HHS to leverage our collective resources to meet the unique needs of older adults. Working through the pandemic highlighted the need to update the OAA regulations to clarify its flexibilities and disaster requirements. Updating the rule also allowed us to provide guidance for programs authorized since the last update, like the family caregiver programs. We also align the regulations with changes made to the law during reauthorizations and address questions that had arisen in the field about the statutory updates. We received input from states, tribes, area agencies on aging, and others. They sought greater clarity on requirements, but underscored the importance of preserving flexibility. The final rule strikes that balance. It reflects best practices from the field and provides the updated modern framework needed to strengthen the network and sustain the OAA's success. ACL is able to have an outsized impact on issues critical to older adults through partnerships, leveraging our programs and the aging network, and coordinating across federal government to prevent duplication between programs. For example, we promote healthy aging with evidence-based programs, many developed by NIH and CDC, that have been proven to improve overall health, prevent falls, and reduce healthcare expenditures. We've partnered across HHS and with the Aging Network and nonprofits on our work to help older adults avoid social isolation. We're collaborating to improve support to the nation's 53 million family caregivers. And we're working with partners across government to address the dire shortage of direct care workers, which is jeopardizing community living for older adults and putting more on family caregivers. We're also partnering with HUD to improve coordination of our programs to support community living and reduce older adult homelessness. With the updated regulations and the partnerships ACL and the Aging Services Network are building across every level of government, OAA programs and the network are well positioned to help older adults maintain their health and independence both today and into the future. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. ACL has appreciated the committee's support of the Older Americans Act and the Aging Services Network, and we look forward to working with you in the future. I'm happy to answer your questions. And you ended right on the button. Congratulations. <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much for being with us, Ms. Barkoff, and the work that you do. Um, we have heard testimony today that millions of seniors are dealing with hunger issues in the United States of America, uh, that a lot of seniors are suffering from loneliness, that too many seniors are falling, um, and that life expectancy is going down for those and, and other reasons. Uh, what would increased funding for the Older Americans Act mean in terms of keeping seniors well-nourished, keeping them in better mental health? Um, what do you think it would mean in terms of actually saving money uh, in terms of cost of Medicare, Medicaid, nursing home costs, cost, et cetera? Try that mic, is your mic on? Yeah. Thank you, Senator Sanders. And as you heard from every single witness today, the OAA programs are incredibly effective. The statistics are 
regarding senior nutrition. For the people we can serve, for the vast majority, we are their one healthy meal in every single day. Our preventative health programs help prevent people from entering emergency rooms. Our programs focused on falls, whether it's the home modifications or evidence-based programs like Tai Chi, help prevent the incredibly um, challenging problems caused by falls, both health problems and incredible expenses. The programs work. What we don't have is the resources to reach everyone. That's why in every single budget since this administration has been in place, we have asked for more resources. We have to target our funding right now to reach those in the greatest need. But we know there are so many more people who could benefit from those services. So additional funding would help our incredible networks reach more people, and it would help us prevent uh, increased healthcare costs from falls, from chronic illnesses, and help people age in place instead of going into expensive nursing homes. Uh, help me out here, but my understanding is that the OAA does not directly provide funding to senior centers. Senior centers utilize the funding, obviously, for congregate meal programs, uh, for the uh, Meals on Wheels program, and for other activities. Uh, in my state, I think we have, and I suspect I speak for many other rural states, a real checkered situation. You have some uh, senior centers that are really doing a great job in terms of exercising, in terms of disease prevention, uh, really wonderful educational programs to engage seniors. Others really are not rural areas having a hard time staffing. You know, maybe they have a half-time staff or inadequately paid. Do we need to take a new approach to senior centers across the country? Senator Sanders, senior centers are a critical part of OAA services, and they have absolutely served our country's older adults well. Um, they are part of Title IIIB of the Older Americans Act and included under the supportive services and senior centers. And the statute does currently authorize acquisition, alteration, construction, modernization, as well as funding to the services provided there. We have seen, and I have gone to a number of senior centers, kind of the evolving senior centers. They have gone from being a place to just going to get a meal to, like you said, really community hubs. You know, they are often places that provide, we, we heard a question from Senator Hassan about intergenerational programming. That's incredibly important. When people are there, we always say it's more than a meal. We're able to evaluate people, connect them with preventative health services, the exercise programs. Um, we are looking and we are working with our partners at NCOA on strategies for modernizing senior centers. It's a great initiative. Thank you for the funding to be able to do that. And I think we are trying to figure out how to best meet the needs of older adults in the future. People really want different kinds of things. And so um, what I would say is I think the infrastructure that we have in the Older Americans Act is an incredible foundation. And we would look forward to working with you on any changes that you think would help strengthen um, senior center services. Okay. Thank you very much. Senator Cassidy. Hey, thanks for being here. Um, and thanks for being here because I will note that Department of Labor has close to 20% of all OAA funding. I was going to ask them about the Senior Community Service Employment Program, and they declined to attend. I'm a little bit kind of befuddled how an agency over which we have jurisdiction declines to come to have oversight conducted. Uh, but that's not your issue, that's the DOL's issue. And by the way, that is is inexcusable in my mind. Um, so let me kind of get back comported <laughs> uh, and find my question for you. Um, your rule, give me some particulars as to what your rule is doing, is, is advocating that is going to make the senior, Miss Hutchins' life better, or someone in Baton Rouge or Shreveport, Louisiana. Give me like boom, 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 three things. Um, I think some of the things that were really important that we put into this rule, you know, one I would say that um, we never had any regulations related to the Family Caregiver Program. We, we heard a lot today about the incredible support from Miss Hutchinson too, um, about families the need for respite, the need for those programs, and it was a real privilege to be able to 
do the first set of regulations there. And what would those regulations, an example of a new regulation? Um, the regulations provide the rules around how to, how to use the funding, how to leverage that, what is the definition of a family caregiver, who is eligible and for And how are you program. leveraging that? Um, how are we leveraging that? Well, we were very... Uh, how would you suggest to leverage it, if you will? Sure. Um, so we've done a couple things with the Family Caregiver Program. Um, first of all, we have been very pleased to have additional funding from Congress over the last couple years to really expand the reach of those programs. For example, I know one thing the committee has cared a lot about is grandparents who are raising grandchildren, and we've been able to expand that reach, something that we've seen really a growing population as part of the epidemic. Um, we have uh, worked... Let me elaborate. Sure. That's actually actually the able grandparent helping the child. Uh, so how does this, but it's not the incapacitated elderly or the, the semi, the less able. So it seems a little bit of a stretch of the original mission, if you follow what I'm saying. So elaborate on that. What are you doing for that grandparent caring for that grandchild? Sure. So the Family Caregiver Program and the statute itself defines who is a caregiver. We absolutely provide supports to family members who are caring for, um, as you said, an older adult who has, uh, who has disabilities and has needs. So the Family Caregiver Program absolutely covers that. It also covers an older adult who is taking care of another family member. And again, we provide services. Now like let me respite. ask, because I don't mean to interrupt. I just got sure. a few minutes, and he's about to gavel me down. <laughs> um, so you have limited dollars. It does seem like you run the risk of the so-called woodworking effect, that the more you cover, far more the more you cover, um, uh, if, if, you, if you follow what I'm saying. And so if you extend the mission of the, of you know, I'm 66, I, I'm kind of like eligible for your services. Uh, but at the same time, if you extend it, are you kind of detracting from the ability to care for that person who's caring for somebody with Alzheimer's in which they truly need a respite program? We prioritize consistent with congressional intent for all of our programs. Again, we don't have enough resources. No, you can't prioritize for all of your programs. You, that's, that's kind of oxymoronic. Well, we do prioritize to those populations in the greatest social and economic need. We work with states and they create a state plan where they look at how are they going to distribute funding across states and different communities using data. From okay, but you can be particular because, because you're speaking, and I know you know your stuff, and so I'm not trying to challenge, but you know so much. And the people watching on the C-SPAN, we've got to drill down to something that they take away, they know it. Can you give me a particular of something post-pandemic that we're now doing differently that would be recognized by Ms. Hutchins or by her family, by her family caring for her? Sure. Um, again, we, um, one of the new things that we have in the Older Americans Act, and I think something that maybe Ms. Hutchins might experience is some of the work that we are doing around inclusive disaster preparedness. It's something that Really, people across Inclusive the Inclusive disaster preparedness in Louisiana, I understand the need for that. So drill a little bit on that, please. Sure, sure. We have, for the first time, put in place requirements um, about how state units on aging and AAAs can respond and help provide additional services when there are disasters that happen, which we are seeing happening more and more across the so country. So if, there's, if somebody's evacuated to an area of congregate living, uh, a, a basketball stadium, uh, for example, and they're on a cot, uh, how would their experience be different because of what you're doing, knowing that there's many other people? Uh, how would their experience be different? Um, through the uh, new regulations, the AAAs will be able to, again, hopefully in advance, be having more of a plan to reach out. Um, they'll be able to surge services through what is in the Older Americans Act with some reimbursement services there, and be able to really help identify who are people who need support from the AAA, who might be able to um, you know, get in-home meals, who might need help with uh, finding accessible housing. And so that's another place where, again, we created an entirely new title to address some of these flexibilities. Okay. Marco, thank you very much. And, and let me again thank all of the panelists for helping us deal with an enormously important issue. And I promise you this committee is going to 
do its best to address the many problems that all of you have raised. Uh, that is the end of our hearing today, and I want to thank all of our witnesses for their participation. For any senators who wish to ask additional questions, questions for the record will be due in 10 business days, March 21st at 5 p.m. Finally, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record nine statements from stakeholder groups outlining the priorities for the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. Without objection, uh, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you.